Hello and welcome to this Astranti Top 10 Most Likely Unseen Issues video for the Strategic Case Study November 2022 and February 2023 exam. In this video, we're going to look at the top 10 most likely issues or the issues that we think are most likely to arise in the exam. As the name would suggest, we have a very good rate of guessing or suggesting which issues are likely to arise. Since the strategic case study started in 2015, we generally have seen around about seven to eight out of our 10 issues appear in every single variant. But before we begin going through the top 10 most likely unseen issues, just going to give a bit of background into where these issues have come from. So we'll look at the basis of choice and also how you can use these issues to prepare for the unseen exam. So we'll start by looking at the basis of the choice. Where did these likely issues come from? Well, for starters, we'll look at the focus in the pre scene for example, if something has been regularly mentioned throughout the pre-scene, such as specific risks that were mentioned throughout the pre-scene or specific opportunities that were mentioned throughout the pre-scene, then that is suggesting that the examiner is thinking of asking a question related to that. That's why they've brought it up time and time again. We'll also look at the degree of importance certain topics have attached to them by the examiner. For example, the examiner specifically said in their examiner reports, very useful read, by the way, if you are preparing for the examiners to find those examiner reports, SEMA does publish them, although they can be a bit tricky to find on their website. The examiner constantly talks about the importance of ethics. And they've specifically mentioned the importance of ethics in their report. They've also specifically mentioned the importance of auditing and the difference between audit and risk and how students sometimes make that mistake thinking that they are the same when in fact they are different. So given that the examiner has specifically mentioned they like to test these topics, again, that means it's more likely for it to arise. We'll also look at the strategic importance of the topic to the organization. For example, if it's a strength of the organization or a key threat to the organization that has been continually mentioned throughout the pre -season. it's a big, big opportunity for the company to take advantage of. And therefore, more likely the directors are to attach importance to that issue. If it's a huge issue or a huge opportunity for the company, and there's been lots of talk about the importance of that opportunity, the directors are likely to think of it as very important. And therefore, remember, the directors are the people asking you the in questions, so to speak, in this exam. They're more likely to ask you questions about it. And finally, our own experience here at Astranti from the number of past exams that we have seen and the typical issues that generally arise within the case study. Also, how easy it is to examine a certain topic. Remember that the people writing the exams are people themselves. They're going to want to find a nice topic that can teach or test a variety of different issues quickly and easily. An example of this is often some sort of strategic option because a strategic option means that you then have to assess the viability of that with regards to the mission and the values of the organization. There's the risk involved, so P3 is being tested. There's the funding as well, so F3 is being tested. So often those sorts of topics are often examined because they're easy to write decent questions about, decent questions that test a variety of subject knowledge. So that's where these issues have come from and here's how you should prepare for them. So for starters, prepare key models from the pre-scene information. So think about your SWOT analysis, your ANSOS, your Mendlow's matrix, your PESTEL, your Porter's Five Forces. Make models for those based on the pre-scene. And if you've watched the strategic analysis video, we've actually done that for you in this strategic analysis video. Then sit mock exams that cover the key issues. Mock exams are the best way to prepare for this exam. Not only does it allow you to test your subject knowledge, but actually it tests more than that. And it tests the more important things. And that is exam technique. Most students who fail the strategic case study do not fail because of lack of subject knowledge. 
because you already have that. You were tested E3, P3, F3 with the subject knowledge. The actual subject knowledge for SES is probably less than those three exams, but it's exam technique. It's managing your time. It's planning your answers effectively, making sure your answer actually answers the specific question asked. So planning and writing practice is fundamental and time management is fundamental to this exam. So mock exams are the best way to test all of it. Also, find relevant real-life examples. Those of you who have at the industry pack that we produce will have seen all those real-life examples and prepare sample paragraphs on them. For example, perhaps there is a real-world issue which is very similar to the likely issues set to arise in the case study exam. We'll find a real-life example of a real-life company and how whatever you're about to suggest worked out for them or what happened to them when they tried to do something or what real life companies have been doing recently. And therefore, that's a suggestion for what you could do and what you could suggest in the exam. And the examiner has, again, in their reports, specifically mentioned that they would like students to use more and more real world examples. Also, learn the typical key points, advantages and disadvantages, and whether or not something is suitable in certain situations. That's always very useful. And once you have that knowledge in your mind, you can regurgitate it a lot more easily than trying to think about it on the spot in the exam. And finally, think about which models to use to support each issue. If there is going to be a question on strategic options, have you looked at the suitability, acceptability, feasibility model and therefore can use that? Have you looked at the Ansoff's matrix and therefore you can use that? So those are the key tips that we have for you for preparing for the exam with regards to the most likely issues. But on that note, we'll now start by looking at our top 10 most likely issues, starting with number 10. And the number 10 most likely issue that we have here is funding. Now, the reason why we have chosen funding is because it is a key F3 topic. It allows the examiner and the marker to test debt funding, to test cost of capital, to test cash flow management, to test equity funding. So it allows for a lot of F3 testing. It's one of the main ways in which F3 is tested in the strategic case study exam. And it's often used as an add-on issue and it often forms part of other questions and it generally always comes up or is expected to be mentioned in your answers, particularly when it comes to analysing projects, analysing new product opportunities or just general any investment opportunity. Because as part of your role mentioned by SEMA in the SCS guide, it's your job to influence and recommend suggestions and recommend options to the CFO, to the board of directors. And that usually means you have to analyze the option with both the risk and source appropriate funding for the option as well. So it usually forms part of that. And as we know from the pre-scene, that cash will likely to be needed to support new large investment projects. They only got 38 million in the bank, remember. And so it's going to probably cost a lot more than that, particularly given that a lot of that money will be needed for working capital. So likely issues for it could be for short-term working capital requirements, overdrafts, for example, to pay bills because of the very high trade payables versus the cash in the bank, or for a longer-term funding requirement for general organic growth and expansion into new countries, new projects, perhaps producing a new product altogether, or indeed an acquisition of another organization. That could be a competitor, it could be vertical integration, it could be someone in the supply chain, or it could be a different type of company altogether. Perhaps they want to purchase a solar panel producing company to start entering the solar panel market. And as I mentioned, it's most likely to be an add-on topic to an investment to a strategic option type issue. And some key points to raise from the pre-scene, and if you use any of these statistics, any of these figures from the precinct here, that will help to 
get to you extra marks as well to add weight to your analysis. The examiner has specifically said they like students to use information from the preceding. They have specifically said they wonder why students don't use more information from the preceding. But if you get any of these statistics and these figures in, then what you will be demonstrating is that you are using the preceding knowledge. You have looked at the precinct, you've understood the precinct, you've brought up key points from the precinct to aid your analysis. So as I mentioned, at 31st of December 2021, Hot Air had 38 million Northern dollars in the bank. Now that may sound like a lot, but some of that will be needed for working capital, for salaries. Remember, we've got nearly 9,000 staff members here at Hot Air. And the current liabilities trade payables, tax liabilities, etc., already very, very high, far higher than the trade receivables. Oh, sorry, far higher than the cash in the bank. Now, they do have a positive current ratio, so if those trade receivables are called in, they would be able to pay off those liabilities. But if they can't get that money and they have to use the cash, they've got less cash than they have liabilities. And cash flow budgeting is a crucial part of an organization's survival. Yes, you might be profitable over the course of a year, but if you get all your money in very early in the year, and then you spend it all, but then you've still got 11 months of salaries and things like that to pay, and you don't have the money for it, even though over a year you may technically on paper be profitable, you're going to have a lot of problems. So it's often very important to budget for negative cash flows and also to have a certain degree, a certain proportion of money set aside for a rainy day, as they say. So the organization probably is going to need to raise additional funding if they were to undertake any new projects. Now, they could undertake that through debt funding. The debt funding is at an okay level, 49.02 or 32.89%, depending on whether you use the long-term debt divided by equity or the long-term debt divided by long-term debt plus equity method for calculating that. There's no right or wrong way to calculate as long as you specify it and you use the same one each time. They also have over 358 million Northern dollars in tangible physical non-current assets that could be used as security to raise additional debt against. Other ways in which they could also raise funding though would be through equity funding. Now equity funding is Unlike debt, it's not as quick. It can be expensive to raise funds for equity, whereas debt is quick and it is low cost. But dividends are optional and there's no need to pay back the capital. Also, we are a traded company, so we can raise money through the stock market. Our share price has increased 150% in the last three years as well. So we might actually be quite an attractive proposition if we were to try to raise money through the stock market. And another model that you would use when you're talking about this sort of thing, when you talk about lenders, equity providers, etc., is where they sit in your Mendlow's matrix, in your stakeholder matrix. Generally, lenders will sit in the keep satisfied category. They're not too interested in your day-to-day -day operations as long as you're paying your interest, etc., but they will have a lot of power over you, particularly if you stop paying that interest. And also your equity providers, again, depending on the size of the holding, small shareholders, perhaps not, but very large institutional shareholders might be very powerful as well. So that's the first issue, funding. And again, it's most likely to appear as part of a, another question, particularly with regards to strategic options or acquisitions or something like that. Now on to issue number nine, and what we've gone for a staffing issue, issues with the staff. And uh, the reason for that, again, is these are incredibly uh, common and leadership, people, stakeholder management skills are very, very important strategic case study topics. They are part of what you are supposed to be able to achieve in terms of the, the syllabus, the SEMA syllabus and SEMA criteria. And these is the most obvious topic that relates to these two criteria. And that's to do with both the management, so the board of directors, and also the staff within the organization. And furthermore, it was specifically mentioned as a risk within the risk report in the pre-scene. 
So what likely issues could there be to do with staffs? Well, perhaps a key staff member leaving. The CEO leaves the organization. Dr. Ava leaves the organization. Now, those of you who watched the other videos, I suggested that this may be something that may happen because they had been a board member for 10 years and governance suggests that there should be nine years as an absolute maximum. So she may leave the organization. Now, what can happen when a key director leaves is that the share price can suddenly react in a really negative way and drop by a huge amount. For example, a couple of years ago, the Tesla CFO left the organization suddenly and the share price dropped almost 10%. And for a company the size of Tesla, that was billions of dollars wiped off the value of the organization. So it can be very critical. So you need to think about how you're going to mitigate that, perhaps by having a suitable succession plan in place. So you've got someone to step into that role as soon as it happens, or you negotiate with them to ensure that they uh, they do stay or that they leave on good terms, etc. Even just saying, I'm leaving because of this reason, I wish all the best for the company. Sometimes something like that, rather than leading under a cloud of speculation over what happens can have a, or at least mitigate the negative impact on the share price. Could also be that staff asking for pay rises or threatening to leave or threatening to leave because of changes to their working conditions, uncertainty in the organization at the moment. If you think about the boiler industry, that is really in decline at the moment. We expect it to be almost gone by 2030. So we've got over 3,000 people working in the boiler department within the organization. What's going to happen to them? Are they going to be made redundant? Are they going to be worried about their job? Are they going to worry that they're not going to be given the opportunity to train to work on the pumps or, or the panels if they go into panels or anything else like that? All of these are big issues. Or it could be that they are growing, that they want to export more. They want to potentially even build factories in other countries to cut down on the costs of exporting. And are they going to be able to find and recruit the right people for that? We know that quality is so critical to this organization. It's one of the big critical success factors. One of the big things that they stand for is quality, reliability, efficiency, safety. All of these need high quality engineers to create the products. So staff are very critical to the organization. And some key points to raise here could be that it's difficult to replace the management experience, particularly if someone like the CEO left. And again, mentioned already the importance of the market confidence and what it can do to your share price. And also the importance to the staff of the strategy. The product quality is a key risk. There's an operational risk to not having enough staff as well and the keeping staff satisfied as almost 9,000 staff members are required. It's also part of the company's underpinning values is to be a safe, a secure place, a place that people want to work. So we, if we are mistreating our staff, we're going against our own values, which of course we as an organization would not want to do, particularly as we keep our promises, remember, and we, if we're promising to be fair to our staff, we must keep our promises, that's one of our values. Some relevant theories here, again, Mendlow's as well, that very important key staff such as the CEO will be key players and this will give them a lot of power in any kind of negotiation. Also, the risk of losing very experienced staff members to competitors would be very detrimental to the organization as well. So that if they en masse were to threaten anything, then that could give them a lot of power. If they were to unionize, for example, trade unions are very common in this sort of industry, then that could be really, well, they could have a lot of power and that could give them a big edge in any kind of negotiation. Also, another theory that you could use here is how do you better support your staff and give them opportunities? It's not just about, oh, we'll just give them more money then, but how do you truly motivate them by giving them recognition, challenging them, giving them new tasks as well, keep them interested? That can also help with staff retention and to reduce staff turnover and also make sure that the staff in general are more satisfied in the workplace. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and uh, more important, you have found it useful. I'd like to just take a moment to uh, tell you about some of the various different case study products that we produce here at Astranti and how they will help you to pass, minimize your study time and represent a good value for money. 
and all of these products are included on our case study course, but you can also purchase these products individually. And we have a range of different products, starting with our exam technique series. In this series of videos, and indeed a study text, we look through the approach to the case study exam, how best to approach it, how to plan your answers effectively, how to turn those plans into answers that are going to secure you the passing mark. We also have a video series looking at the theory revision, taking the key topics from the E3, P3 and F3 syllabus, looking at what those mean for the strategic case study as well, and also just giving you the chance to refresh your knowledge, particularly if it had been a while since you had looked at your strategic objective test papers. We then have the pre-scene analysis, detailing look at the pre-scene, looking through the pre-scene itself, but also looking at the strategic analysis, how the different models within the strategic syllabus apply to the pre-scene, and our top 10 most likely unseen issues. We also have an industry analysis document, which looks at the industry, details the industry, details the history of the industry, some of the key issues facing the industry, and major companies within that industry in the real world also has a series of important industry examples that you can use in your answers. We then have a series of mock exams that come with mock debrief videos looking at how you would answer this particular exam if you wanted that as your feedback. But we do have a marking and feedback option as well, which allows you to get your script marked, your mock exam marked, by a trained marker that has experience marking both mock and real SEMA exams and providing a detailed feedback for you to improve and build upon your knowledge. We also have question packs that will give you lots of opportunity to write additional answers outside of the mock exams for very specific questions. And we've got lots of very, very specific broken down questions. If you are struggling with a particular topic with a particular competence, etc., that you can answer specific questions based on those to really improve your knowledge. And it's also just additional question writing practice. And we also have a series of masterclasses as well. These are live events where you will learn more about planning your answers, more about how to approach the exam and also there'll be lots of very important hints and revision tips and other tips that will help you to pass this exam. And if you are purchasing all of these on the course, we also can offer what we call a double guarantee. And that is a 14 day money back guarantee. So if you purchase the course and you're not satisfied, you can claim a full refund within 14 days. And we also have our pass guarantee. And this is where as long as you have demonstrated that you have fulfilled the course requirements, such as watching all the videos, submitting all your mock exams, attending the master classes. And if you still do not pass the exam, we will give you another course for free as part of our pass guarantee. So thanks for watching. If you do have any other questions about the Astranti case study courses, please feel free to contact us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And if you just have any general questions, then by all means, email us and visit our website. So thank you for watching. I hope to see you on another video soon.